So, greetings everyone uh, who has joined us on this platform this afternoon in Mumbai, but probably different times of the day or night in different parts of the world. And uh, today we also have the other co-director of the Mias Institute, Professor Klaus Tierstoffer, who has also been able to join us. So greetings from both of us to everyone. We are very happy to have one more lecture in the Mias lecture series of uh, 2023. This is, I think, the fourth lecture, if I'm right. And uh, we are very, very happy that Autar Bra is doing this lecture for us. We have been hounding her for over a year now to do this lecture for her. She's been very busy launching her new book. And uh, she's probably going to talk a little in that context to us. So we are very happy. Avtar is a very old friend. And our chair today, Professor Vibhuti Patel, is going to be introducing her. So I won't be saying much in the formal way about her, but I'd like to say that Avtar is a dear friend of COHAB, COHAB IDC, and now MIAS, the Mumbai Munster Institute of uh, International Studies and the Advanced Studies. And uh, she's also on our advisory board. And of course, we people in the area of, we are not sociologists within the area of diaspora and the work that we do in feminism. Uh, Autas books are our go-to kind of books, whether it's the cartographies of diaspora or her books on internet, intersectional feminism. So I'm sure the students who may be joining in now because they have got exams, oral exams in the case of some of the students, but this talk is being recorded. So we'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel and I'm sure they're really looking forward to Professor Autar Bra's talk. And before I hand over the uh, talk today to our chair, uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel, a brief word of introduction. Vibhuti is again a close friend, a dear friend of the Mumbai Munster Institute of Advanced Studies. And she has been to several of our conferences in person as well as uh, virtually. She has been a great sport and even undertaken adventures and misadventures on the basis of the uh, mm. Mias Institute and traveled overnight by bus from Ahmedabad to Bhuj when the uh, airlines decided to go on strike and cancel the uh, direct flight from Mumbai to Bhuj. So we are, of course, very thankful for Vibhuti for being this good friend, very reliable, dependable friend, and of course, a great scholar and somebody we look forward to chairing our session today. Uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel, just a brief word of introduction, Vibhuti, uh, is currently the Vice President of the Indian Association for Women's Studies. She retired as Professor, Advanced Center for Women's Studies, School of Development Studies, uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And before that, she was the Professor and Head of Economics Department of the SNDT Women's University, Mumbai. She was Director of their Research Center as well. Uh, she has done her doctorate in eco economics from the University of Mumbai and she's done her postdoctoral fellowship from the Association of uh, Commonwealth Universities at, at the London mm -hmm. of Economics and Political Science. And uh, Vibhuti's areas of specialization have been gender economics, women's studies, human rights, social movements, and gender budgeting. She has authored a whole lot of books, several books, and uh, lots and lots of papers in various journals, as well as anthologies. She has been a member of various expert committees for uh, universities in India, the government in India, and uh, she has prepared the base paper for gender for Mumbai Human Development Report. And uh, she's also a go-to person for a lot of the governmental agencies and uh, university agencies for gender-based and economics-based studies. Uh, Vibhuti has been a member of the 
expert committee for working group on discrimination against women and girls of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And uh, during the uh, last three and a half decades in the world of economics, uh, sorry, in the world of academics, Professor Vibhuti Patel has presented papers, been a resource person at national and international seminars, conferences, done several collaborative research projects in not only in India, but various parts of the world. And uh, her focus, which is, I think, where we have, we thought that she would be the best person to chair today's session, has been a lot on the issues of intersectionality, where gender development and social justice meet. So I request Professor Vibhuti Patel to take over the session, introduce our speaker today, and be in charge of it. Vibhuti. Thank you very much, Professor Nilofar Barucha. Am I audible? Mm, yeah. Yes. Hi. Hello. I express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Nilofar Barucha for director of uh, MMIS, University of Mumbai. And I also congratulate for starting this series, which is so important and uh, contemporary challenges that we are facing uh, because of the new kind of political environment that we have. I think these uh, subjects are extremely important. Decoloniality has so many ramifications in most of the post-colonial societies. And perspectives and practices of decoloniality demand serious discourses on intersectionality and interdependence as against sociocultural hegemony and ideology of dominance and power fostered by neoliberalism. Over the last two decades, we have witnessed massive churning happening in the field of art and music, education and health, politics and economics around colonial hangover. Indigenous people, ethnic and religious minorities, LGBTQIA plus communities, the post-colonial feminists and thinkers committed to decoloniality have challenged colonial construct of every, uh, that and quote unquote, uh, everything has to be rigidly defined and have only one definition. The fluidity of decoloniality allows for more multifaceted approach to decolonization so that various aspects of colonial hegemonic thinking and practices could be deconstructed and challenged simultaneously. For understanding, as Kimberly Crenshaw explains, and I quote, the complex and cumulative <laughs> way in which effects of multiple forms of discrimination combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized and intersectional lens is an answer. It facilitates replacing of inequitable policies and actions in, with policies and practices of that ensure equality, rights, and justice. Today's lecture on thinking decoloniality through an intersectional lens by Professor Avtar Bra, uh, a professor emerita of Burbank College, University of London, uh, is extremely important in, in this context. Her research covers fields of race and ethnicity, decolonial theory, diaspora studies, intersectionality studies, and feminist and social theory. Her books include cartographies of diaspora, contesting identities, hybridity and its discontents, politics, science and culture, edited with uh, and comps, thinking identities and global futures, both edited with Mary Hickman and Mary Martin Mack. Uh, her most recent book is Decolonial Imagining, Intersectional Conversations and Contestations, published by Goldsmith and MIT Press in uh, 2022. She was appointed MBE in 2001 for services to race, gender, and ethnicity identity issues. She has been visiting professor at the University of California since 1992 and Cornell University in 2001. Now, I request Professor Avtar Bra to make a presentation on Thinking decoloniality through an intersectional lens. Over to Dr. Brahma. Thank you, Professor Patel, for that introduction. Um, I'm actually delighted to be with you all. Um, uh, it's been, as, as Nilofer said, we are actually old friends, and it's really great to be together on these occasions. And um, so I would like to begin by thanking Nilofer and her colleagues 
um, for inviting me to participate in what I hope will be a collective conversation between us. Questions of gender are crucially important, of course, both subjectively as well as socially and politically. It is important to emphasize that we cannot define gender along a binary of supposedly male and female. Far from it. Rather, we have to address the whole spectrum of gender yeah. relations. Hello? Can you hear I'm me? Sorry, sorry no, after I'm I wasn't muted. Sorry, after I forgot to mute myself. It was okay. me. Many apologies. Do you want me to start again? Yeah, no, no. I okay. okay, all right. Questions of gender are crucially important subjectively as well as socially and politically. It is important to emphasize that we cannot define gender along a binary of supposedly male and female. Far from it. Rather, we have to address the whole spectrum of gender formations, including transgender, non-binary and other identities. What is of particular significance is the ways in which gender has been socially constructed and represented. There is, of course, the abiding stereotypic imagery, which may be a common staple underpinning gender discursive formations, but we need to consider the unboundedness of gender, its fluidity and multiplicity. How we name ourselves is then essentially a political act rather than a biological imperative. Women's subordinate position across the globe is well documented, but there are specificities associated with each society. It is a truism to note that women do not constitute a homogeneous category. Rather, we are socially constructed and differentiated along the lines of such factors as class, racism, ethnicity, debility, and age. Our experiences are steeped in and marked by power dynamics that attend the workings of these axes of differentiation. These intersecting articulations mean that our lives are lived lives are complex. A middle or upper class woman is likely to have better life chances than, say, a working class or poor man. Similarly, the skin color of a white woman may result in and provide social advantages vis-a-vis -vis black man in a society where there is racism. There can be negative connotations involved even when a supposedly positive requirement is invoked, as when convention places greater emphasis on women's beauty as compared to her other accomplishments. So how do we tackle the issue of thinking decolonially through an intersectional lens? Before addressing this topic, I wish to indicate how my work on decoloniality is situated within the broader frame of my research and writing. I have worked at three universities in Britain, Leicester University, the Open University and Birkbeck College, University of London. For a period at Birkbeck, I worked at the, in the Department of Continuing Education and in my then capacity of lecturer in multicultural education, I helped develop a diploma level extramural course, some of which were taught by academic staff who came from outside Birkbeck. So we actually had lecturers from outside Birkbeck teaching on our courses which was unusual. The course topics included a study of different varieties of racism ranging from anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-Jewish, anti-Arab and anti-Irish racism. Even though Irish people are white, but they suffer racism in Britain. What was the specificity of color in these different racisms, we asked. We examined socioeconomic, political, and cultural dimensions of racism in the curriculum, in staff recruitment, sport and progression, and of course, in everyday life. Apart from racism, we also explored themes related to gender 
class, ability, debility, and sexuality. Our primary aim was to dismantle structures of intersectional inequities and inequalities in the higher education sector and to help foster a politics of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Subsequently, I developed a postgraduate level program in race and ethnicity, which addressed structural and cultural facets of our life worlds. More recently, I have shifted the focus of my attention to questions of coloniality and decoloniality. In my recent book, Decolonial Imaginings, Intersectional Conversations and Contestations, as the title implies, I have explored processes and critical genealogies of coloniality and decoloniality and their manifestations and legacies in our present day social and psychic landscape. This work emerges out of my intellectual concerns and pursuits and political activism surrounding effects and differential impact of the intersections between these various factors such as gender, class, ethnicity, and sexuality on our lives. It attempts to deploy analytical frameworks that foreground the interweavings of issues of borders, boundaries, relationalities, and antagonisms, but also connectivity. Questions of solidarities within and across difference are at the heart of the text. My new book has been written in the midst of the seismic impact of the pandemic COVID-19, when by the middle of February 2023, 775 million cases and over 6.8 million deaths are reported globally. We have witnessed global lockdowns when whole populations have had to go into self-isolation. In Britain, and undoubtedly this is not the case only in Britain, people in deprived areas have experienced a death rate that is twice that of those living in poor, in affluent areas. There have been disproportionate deaths among men, older people, frontline workers, and black and minoritized ethnic groups. The reasons for these disparities are complex. In the case of Black and minoritized ethnic groups, for instance, socioeconomic disadvantage and the effects of racism would seem to be among key factors at work. Black and minoritized ethnic groups in Britain are more likely to work in what are called high-risk frontline jobs, and they tend to live in deprived, crowded areas, and some reside in multi-generational households with limited space. In other words, this is a story about social inequality. In all this, one figure that has emerged as being especially demonized in both popular and political discourse in Britain has been that of the migrant. This figure has been associated with negative connotations. The imagery contained in these representations constructs the migrant as threatening and alarming, as an object of fear. There has been a clamor in political and social circle for the introduction of harsh social policies to keep the numbers of migrants down. These policies have included the most notorious hostile environment measures. They are called actually hostile environment measures because they were designated as such by the then Home Secretary. Designed to either deport migrants or to put pressure on them to leave voluntarily. They were introduced in 2012 when the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, announced a policy strategy to, com to combat illegal migration by making life so unbearable, she said, for undocumented migrants that they would leave voluntarily. Suddenly, landlords, doctors, employers, staff across educational facilities, community workers, and more became legally responsible for assessing individuals' immigration status before engaging them, engaging them in work. 
the policies which emerged from the hostile environment effectively called upon the public to take on border policing rules in their everyday lives. And many of us didn't like that. There is a long history in Britain of hostility towards migrants from non-European countries, even when they were needed for economic reasons. But more recently, even European migrants, especially from Eastern Europe, came to be viewed as problematic and threatening. The political climate created by the noxious discourse of hostile environment deeply impacted the lives of a variety of groups, including refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, as well as racialized settled communities. The life chances of these categories of people and their socio-economic, cultural and political predicaments form a central part of the story of contemporary Britain. Okay, I now turn my attention to the topic of coloniality and decoloniality, discourse and practice. Increasingly, as already noted, scholars are drawing attention to the importance of coloniality, decoloniality in the modern world, especially in relation to epistemic genealogies. Indeed, as scholars such as Stuart Hall have argued, coloniality is constitutive of modernity. In these readings, a focus on knowledge regimes is complemented by analysis of economic and political dimensions. The term decolonization was transformed into decoloniality towards the end of the Cold War. Because before then, we used the term decolonization rather than decoloniality. With the aim in large part to foreground decolonization of knowledge, so as to critique, challenge, and dismantle colonial epistemic hierarchies. I have detected a pronounced tendency in decolonial thought to claim that previous analysis of colonialism was likely to overemphasize the study of economic and political consequences of colonialism rather than that of knowledge practices. My position is that the veracity of this claim is debatable since a number of theorists such as Gayatri Spivak, Edward Said, and John M. McKenzie long ago addressed questions of knowledge production within the colonial context. In other words, what is more important, I would suggest, is that any effective political strategy must always include epistemic as well as socioeconomic, cultural, and political differentiations and cleavages. To fail to tackle these dimensions is analytical as well as socially problematic. It is important to recognize that the discourse of decoloniality has emerged in parallel with the discourse of postcoloniality. The concept of postcolonial, though the two are, of course, quite distinct development. The concept of postcoloniality is associated primarily with context and experience of British colonialism. Whereas the notion of decoloniality, which is comparatively more recent, it's only in the last kind of decade or so that has come to the forefront in a major kind of way, which is comparatively more recent, is more likely to be applied to the experience of South America, the Caribbean, and the Latino populations in the USA, and I suspect to other parts of the world as well. One could view these twin concepts as making complementary projects with similar goals of transformation. Stuart Hall has been one of the key figures to theorize the post-colonial, referring to transnational and transcultural global processes that are seen as a departure from narratives of the nation, which was a focus in the prior period. In his well-known essay titled, When Was the Post-Colonial? Thinking at the Limit, he points to the post-colonial time as a time of difference. Hall theorizes colonization as part of 
an essentially transnational and transcultural global process that entails a rewriting of earlier nation-centered imperial grand narratives. He argues that as both concept and practice, the post-colonial is fully attuned to, and I quote, questions of hybridity, syncretism, cultural undecidability, and the complexities of diasporic identification, which interrupt any return to ethically closed or central original or centered original histories. End of, end of quote. Thus, the concept of home referenced here is not an essentialist one, rather it is a historically produced modality. If Stuart Hall has been an advocate of the concept of the post-colonial, colonial, Walter Mignolo has been a major proponent of the concept of decoloniality, emphasizing its relationship to modernity, its interrogation of the rhetoric of development and modernization, as well as its posing of a challenge to the analytical apparatus of Marxist materialism. Though I would suggest that there is no inherent reason why decoloniality should be antagonistic to Marxist materialism. However, what is clear is that whilst the legacies of colonialism are common to both projects, they are theorized and analyzed differently. It is evident that although formally and directly colonized people, uh, sorry, um, formally and directly colonized societies may no longer be as common today as they once were, but they're far from absent. Present day British colonies include Anguilla, Bermuda, Falkland Islands, and Gibraltar, quite a few of them. The point is that coloniality as an ideology and discursive formation with very real material effects and impact is still very much round. It's live and well. Thinking of the term decoloniality, a few questions come immediately to mind. How do we analyze decoloniality? How do we differentiate between decolonization and decoloniality? How do we explore the present day consequences of colonization and decolonization? Generally speaking, the term decolonization as distinct from decoloniality refers to the processes, events, and histories of political challenge and resistance mounted by colonized peoples, which led to the declaration of political independence of the colonies. For instance, India, the country of my birth, gained political independence in 1947, whereas Uganda, the country where I grew up, did not achieve independence until 1962. And as noted above, there are countries which still exist in a colonial relationship with Britain. It is important to bear in mind that colonial, colonialism is a socio-economic, political and cultural mode of exploitation and oppression, which deeply marks the subjectivities, the very interiority of the minds and identities of both the colonizers and the colonized. So it affects, it has an impact on both sides of the binary. All bit differently, of course, um, through a hierarchical relationship. If decolonization, as already discussed, is primarily a socio-economic, political and cultural project, the concept of decoloniality is taken to foreground knowledge regimes that underpin these processes. The point to emphasize here is that knowledge is very much part and parcel of forces of appropriation. Decoloniality invites us to prioritize regimes of knowledge that have been sidelined, ignored, forgotten, or repressed by the forces of modernity, colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism. I have explored the concept of coloniality, post-coloniality, and decoloniality in some detail 
because they centrally inform my analysis, especially in terms of feminist decoloniality, which offers a gendered reading of capitalist modernity. Decolonial feminist politics interrogate, challenge, and finally aim to erase the colonial difference embedded in the notion of coloniality of power. The concept of coloniality of power highlights the inseparability of racialization and capitalist exploitation. Whilst formal colonialism may be over, as I've already noted, but the power relations derived from colonialism are an important feature of our contemporary world. They shape the relationship between the poor and rich countries of the globe, as well as mark internal, social, and cultural hierarchy within a particular society. Now I turn my attention to a project which has deployed decoloniality in, in the kind of way I've been discussing. And I've titled that as Black Feminism, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. In Britain, the project of politically Black Feminism those people, those of us who came together and constituted and called ourselves black feminists, we were not all black in term, terms of the color of our skin. Some of us were brown and some were darker shades, you know, etc. But we called ourselves black feminists. And in this, so it was actually a politically black feminism we spoke of not the skins of a color. So in Britain, the project of politically black feminism has been at the forefront of enact, enacting decolonial politics. It emerged as a feminist coalition un, amongst women of African, Caribbean, and South Asian heritage. Black feminism rose to prominence in the 1960s as the civil rights movement tended to exclude women from leadership positions and the mainstream feminist movement largely focused its agendas on issues that predominantly impacted middle-class white women. From the 1970s to the 1980s, black women formed groups that addressed and interrogated the role or position of black women in society. With this questioning of the gendered and racialized subtext of Britishness, this form of feminism profoundly challenges the meaning of British national identity and its unspoken assumptions of whiteness. From this positionality, black women reveal other ways of knowing that interrogate how modes of white privilege and patriarchal power is constituted and pervades everyday interactions. As I argued in my 1992 essay, Difference, Diversity and Differentiation, Black women's activism prized open a previously closed way of thinking that had asserted the importance of class over all other axes of differentiation, such as racialized positionality. I think some of us will remember that, a time when actually everything was class, 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 you know, and other issues like culture, over gender and uh, sexuality, you had to actually fight to get space to discuss those. Contemporary Black feminism in the UK has its roots in the post-colonial activism and struggles of women migrants from the Caribbean, South Asia, and Africa. Most, the, most of these women came to occupy jobs in the lower echelons of the economy as cheap labor. Some of the iconic struggles of the period, industrial struggles of the period, were led by women. And some of you may know that, others may not, obviously, if you're not in, from Britain. As for instance, the well-known industrial dispute at Granwick Film Processing Laboratory in Chapter Hill Road in the London suburb of Wilston, that lasted two years between 1976 and 1978. The dispute was essentially about trade union recognition, working conditions, pay inequality, and um, institutionalized racism 
within the company. But as Jaya Bain Desai, a prominent leader of the strikers, argued, it was critically also about human dignity. So that's important to emphasize human dignity in all these struggles. Desai was an inspiring organizer who spoke out against racist and sexist comments aimed at her and other striker workers who were mainly women of South Asian heritage. She felt that there was insufficient support for the Trade Union Congress for their cause. Jim Callahan, the then Prime Minister, appointed a judge, Lord Scarman, to settle the dispute. However, his recommendations that the union be recognized and the sacked workers be reinstated was ignored by the factory owner. Leaving the Granik Strike Committee to announce that the strike was over on July 14, 1978. You may think it was a little bit of a, uh, of, of, uh, of a negative end, but on the other hand, the strike itself galvanized a whole section of the working population. I was part of the development of the politically black women's movement, initially in Bristol, but more substantially in London. I was active in it from the 19, late 1970s until the 1980s, when I moved from London to Leicester to take up a new job. Together, we, Asian, African, and Caribbean heritage women, critiqued, interrogate, interrogated, and critically organized against the ways in which racialized patriarchal relations in Britain maintained our subordination. We were women with different colors of skin, but we defined ourselves politically as black women. We opposed a range of institutions and political policies such as immigration laws with their massive impact in terms of separating families, particularly Asian families across continents, forms of oppressive policing and other social policies which had a negative impact on racialized communities. Today, it is likely that the term black is reserved for those with black African heritage and the term people of color is deployed to cover other groups with ancestry in Africa, Asia, the Middle East and Latin America, as well as indigenous groups. It is important to analyze the genealogies of political formations, such as the black, such as the people of color, within the context of their colonial and imperial histories. British black feminism and other feminisms of color contested those aspects of white feminism, sometimes understood through the ethnocentric lens as de-feminism, which produced racist outcomes. Here it may be important to bring into the orbit of our discussion the concept of politics of location. Those of you who have been steeped in feminist uh, theory will recognize this concept, politics of location, which was developed by families such as Adrian Rich and Chandra Talpa Devohanti. This term addresses the ways in which axes of differentiation, such as gender, race, and class, are theorized as intersecting modalities in which we are all differently positioned. Today, we are likely to use the concept of intersectionality associated most closely, though not exclusively, with Kimberly Crenshaw to analyze these intersections. So today we, what used to be called politics of location, and, and people have short memory, you know, they forget, they think that intersectionality is something new, but actually it isn't something new. It has been around for some time, but it is now called something different. And of course, it has now become, a, has a wider purchase. That's true. Finally, I turn to the issue of what I have called borders and boundaries in this presentation. Questions of coloniality and decoloniality cannot be fully addressed without taking on board how borders and boundaries are constituted, maintained, played out, challenged, and sometimes erased. The theme of migration, movement, and mobilities need to be situated in relation to borders and boundaries where borders and boundaries are conceptualized not simply 
as territorial, so they are importantly territorial, but also as social, cultural, political, socioeconomic, and psychological. So it's a wider sense of the border. Border fa borders facilitate crossings some, for some groups of people and hinder them for others. Border crossings may become highly politicized events. And international politics, as we know, is thoroughly enmeshed in the governance of borders. Following Atian Baliba, I'm interested in what he say, and, and he calls it, what borders actually do a specific historical conjunctures. Not that they exist, but what do they actually do? Questions of ethnicity, nationalism, national identity and belonging are central to thinking about borders. Hence, it is important to examine the ways in which these concepts and the interrelation between them has been theorized. I argue for a non-essentialist conception of these categories. In general, ethnicity refers to the fact of belonging to a group or subgroup made up of people who share a common cultural background or descent. In comparison, nation is a large body of people united by common ancestry, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. In fact, a nation may contain several ethnicities within it. The question of national identity foregrounds the sense of nation as a cohesive whole, as represented by distinctive traditions, culture, and language. Associated with these terms is the notion of nationalism, which marks identification with one's own nation and support for its interests especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interest of other nations. Overall, then, this interrelated network of concepts provides a toolkit with which to analyze how our identities are formed, maintained, or challenged. That is to say that the complexities, how boundaries of us and them are constructed and played out in our lives are such that becomes necessary to deploy such a range of conceptual ensemble in order to comprehend them. Histories of immigration law are instructive in helping us think through borders and boundaries of them and us. How, for instance, might policies of immigration control be instituted? Or how anti-migrant popular and state rhetoric could come to be exploited by the political right which it is always do done, at least in, in Britain. On the other hand, it is equally necessary to examine how we may develop bonds of commonality, connectivity, and conviviality. I would suggest that we formulate a notion of non-essentialist universalism, or what following Walter Mignolo we may call pluriversalism, that enables the emergence of a politics of solidarity alliance and support. To think about borders reminds us of the ways in which diasporas are created in today's world. Migration and mobility have become commonplace, even as much of the world's population is not necessarily on the move. That's the sort of contradiction, really. Deal, these mobilities vary in type. For instance, some are a result of forced migration such as flows of refugees and asylum seekers, while others are voluntary, such as movements of people in search of better opportunities and life chances. So of course, forces of economic necessity might render it problematic to call them voluntary, in a sense. How might we conceptualize diasporas? This is both a theoretical and empirical question. Empirically, we have a wide range of diasporas scattered around the globe. We may focus on a single diasporic group or compare and contrast two or more diasporas. Theoretically, the issue is one in which questions of conceptual elaboration become paramount as we formulate analytical frameworks to analyze a social problem. 
In my own work, especially in the text cartographies of diasporas, I've theorized diasporas as social relations, as experience, as subjectivity, and as identity. Each of these terms in turn may be subjected to theoretical scrutiny. How do we theorize subjectivity, for instance? Through a psychoanalytic conceptual repertoire or within a sociological lens? My concept of diaspora space has become established as an important construct in feminist studies and diaspora studies and is widely used. Yet, whilst there's a large body of literature on diasporas, there's limited material that addresses the field of diaspora studies and feminism together. My attempt to tackle the subject is one of the first to foreground the articulation of gender and diaspora. I analyze diaspora as a historically specific genealogy in the Foucauldian sense, and diaspora space as an articulation of diaspora, border, and politics of location. The emerging field of queer studies constitutes an important new development. Studies in this arena challenge nationalist ideologies by highlighting diaspora as a space of the impure, inauthentic, and non-essentialist. Hence, there is an undermining of conceptions of a world of pure and authentic domains of essentialism. It poses a challenge to those notions, essentialist notions of purity and authenticity. Whilst there's a very significant body of literature that treats the subject diaspora and intersectionally separately, I, just, I try to bring these two fields together. The point is that diasporas are inherently intersectional and that the study of diasporas and intersectionality is closely related. The interrelationship between diaspora and intersectionality has a common focus on and through difference foreground both conceptual and embodied connections. I'm soon, soon coming to the end. Decolonial imaginings are to some considerable extent about the politics of alterity and alliance. The alterity on one hand, alliance on the other. In other words, coalition politics are central to imagining decolonial features. And I emphasize that that coalition politics are central to imagining decolonial futures. Decolonial politics are centrally concerned with questions of equality, rights, and justice. They underline the importance of dialogue across differences, differences of gender, class, ethnicities, and how we might be differently racialized, depending, for instance, on our color. Decolonial politics are essentially about solidarity and alliance forged around shared agendas. They foreground how both individually and collectively we develop a politics of working together, a politics of solidarity. Because of course we can't take shared agendas for granted. Shared agendas have to be constructed through politics. Scholars and political activists such as Sylvia Winter, Angela Davis, and Chandra Kalpande Mahamanti draw our attention to how we might refigure the human in such ways that humanness comes to be seen as a verb rather than simply a noun. Noun. I rather like that putting way, it that way, you know. It's not just a, a noun, but it's a verb, thereby underlining and emphasizing political practice. The concept of cosmopolitan may become useful in, in addressing political practices. A cosmopolitan imagination helps illuminate local and global connections and cosmopolitan sensibility enhances the capacity to care and uh, to care for and have obligations to others. It foregrounds the importance of simultaneously upholding the principle of diversity as well as that of shared public culture. Boventura de Sousa Santos advocates what he calls an ethos of <coughs> insurgent cosmopolitanism, another term I rather like, insurgent cosmopolitanism, or 
a counter hegemonic globalization from below, consisting of transnationally organized resistance. Insurgent cosmopolitanism defines the responses, slug struggles, and politics of resistance by press groups aiming to unite through trans local and local linkages. Insurgent cosmopolitanism, which I endorse, underscores the importance of intercultural translation that, that politics may serve as a resource in the service of social and political justice. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs>